Welcome to Beyond Accessibility, How Spatial Computing Will Impact Human Experience. I have with me today Thomas Logan from Equal Entry. Thomas, would you like to say hi? Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Caitlin Krause. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. I'm from MindWise. Yu Hong Zhao. Hi, everyone. I'm Yu Hong from Cornell Tech. Very nice to see everyone here. And uh, Brian Schwab will be with us momentarily. So while we're waiting for Brian, why don't we start with introductions? And as you introduce yourself, I'd like for you to um, talk about the change that you'd like to see in the world. We have so many things going on right now in the world that are changing and need change. So what are you passionate about and how is your work making a change in the world? Thomas, we're gonna start with you. Great, thank you. So uh, my name is Thomas Logan and I'm the owner of a company called Equal Entry. So my company is all focused on making sure that technology works for people with disabilities. Um, I spent my whole career working in this topic and you know excited to be at this presentation today i always want the newest technologies to be available and working for people with disabilities so i'm, I'm very passionate that xr vr ar um, all of these things should work for people who are blind deaf mobility impaired cognitive impairment um, and i think it's very exciting to consider that with these new technologies we have a whole new way of making information accessible to people. Great. Caitlin? Well, it's wonderful to be here. I just want to pause to make sure that my audio is working and you can hear me. It is. Yes. Yeah. OK, awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I founded the company MindWise about five years ago. and. Um, it has accessibility values at heart. I combine storytelling in different digital media with um, mindfulness practices as well as design thinking strategies. So really focused on human-centered design. And I think Susan's point, I respond really strongly to it. You know, it, life's too short to build something that the world doesn't need. So I've been doing a lot of listening lately and trying to figure out in this time of um, suffering and a lot of unrest, how we can create experiences, products, you know, really design that has a function and is also engaging and fun. So I've been focusing a lot on experiences that build wonder lately and just wrote a book called Designing Wonder. Um, that's all about the experience design, both uh, in different models of uh, VR, AR, XR, um, and also in the quote unquote real world. So I'm excited to be here and also talk about what is reality in this space that feels very visceral and, and real right now with these incredible people. So um, thanks very much. If, if we're going down the line, I could pass the mic to you, Han, right here next. Well, I just, I want to acknowledge that, uh, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. One is we have Brian here. Hi, Brian. You're looking Hi. very tall today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know quite how to lower myself on this device. <laughs> um, I, I think you should just sit down. <laughs> yeah. So I also want to acknowledge the awkwardness of the technology. Uh, this is where we're at with the technology, and we wanted to try it uh, with all its imperfections. So I uh, really appreciate everybody hanging in there with us, um, and I hope that you can appreciate the. The difficulty and the achievement at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we're in spatial and we're shooting live at a location at phase two in Culver City, California. So we're in a live setup, but each of the speakers is being um, brought in through their avatar, through uh, the spatial networking app that allows you to do mixed reality. So. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yu Hong, would you like to continue? 
So Brian, just so yeah. you know, we're answering, um, we're just introducing ourselves in the context of what change do you want to see in the world and how is your work impacting that? And you hung us next. Yeah. yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Yu Hong Zhao. I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, from Cornell Tech. And this is a very uh, exciting experience here. Actually, this is my first panel actually happening in virtual reality. Uh, so actually, uh, I will be joining um, uh, the CS department uh, in the University of Wisconsin Medicine very soon uh, as an assistant professor uh, in uh, 2021 and start my new lab. And my research focuses on human-computer interaction uh, and specifically uh, accessibility and mixed reality. And I'm very interested in exploring how we can uh, leverage uh, the emerging mixed reality technology to uh, enhance human abilities and specifically, uh, for example, people with visual impairments and how can we provide visual and audio augmentations to enhance their ability in uh, all kinds of daily activities, for example, shopping, navigation, reading, and socializing. And also, on the other hand, well, mixed reality technology has shown its great potential, uh, but I also think that this technology in itself has still have a lot of accessibility and usability issues as you may see there can be some awkwardness here like we are experiencing as well. So uh, another aspect of my uh, techno uh, research is also to explore how to best shape this technology to make it more accessible and useful for people with diverse abilities. So personally, I really believe in the future of mixed reality, and I believe that maybe in the next 20 years, everyone will wear smart glasses and people can all connect in both the virtual and the physical world. Uh, and here, of course, the mixed reality refers to a broader concept, and not only about people with disabilities, but also people, maybe older adults, people with lower income, people with lower uh, education level, and so on. Well, my research specifically focused on people with disabilities, but I do believe that all assisted technologies have the potential to be uh, extended and adopted by broader population who do not have disabilities. So that's why I'm very excited here today to discuss all these exciting topics with everyone. Great, thank you so much, Yu Hong. And so Brian, we're so glad yes. you're here. Tell us about your work and what changes you're creating in the world. Um, so I, I started in games a long, long time ago, and I was trying to make very, very compelling user interfaces. And and I think that that's been going on for a long time. And I think that, that no one would say that those are sort of like accessible interfaces, although they are in some ways very, very fun. But in many ways, they 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 become even less accessible to, to the the lay person if you have if you have um, not not complete use of some of your fingers or, or or you don't see very well or you have you have color blindness like a lot of us do or or even you're just too old to practice you know because you've got a job you know you're you're not a kid and so games are not super accessible but they are a beautiful place for learning about what people like what makes people feel powerful and like how people can use computers to like learn things quickly, learn complex rule sets and get, get mastery of those rule sets. Like games does, does a lot for us. But when I, when I stopped being fully in the game industry, I joined a company called Magic Leap. And what Magic Leap was fundamentally trying to do, at least my part of it, was to work on the advanced inputs that a wearable computer gave to the system. And once you actually put a computer directly on a person, you start to have to learn directly about humanity as opposed to how to better train humans to interface with the computer. You're more trying to train the computer how to interface with the human. It's the other way around, right? And so to me, that's, that's what Magic Leap did for me was it gave me a, a, my first real theater to kind of like push on the, the human side of human-computer interaction instead of being more and more compellingly minimalist or, or, or abstracted on the computer side. And so for, for me, what, what's, what's beautiful about XR and, and wearable computing and that kind of thing is that 
it's it's pushing on everyone to learn more and more about humans, about about what it is to be human, about human behavior, about what we expect to happen when we reach out with our hand. I don't think a lot of the things that are going on right now, you see people's hands on this couch. I don't think it's what they're expecting their hands to be doing. And like, and it's kind of funny to watch it play out like this, but at the same time, like this technology, wearable computing is, it's, it's almost like a codified reason for advancing our empathy as, as, as human researchers and, and, and definitely as computing researchers. So that's, that's, the work I've been trying to push on, and that's that's why I do I do what I do. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate the point of view that you bring to this panel. Uh, I've been reading some of your articles, and I came across your article on entrainment, and I thought it uh, coincided quite nicely with the work that Caitlin is doing. And I wanted to know if you talk a little bit um, about that and. Do you feel that um, by increasing entrainment and engagement with uh, when you're in the space, does that impact accessibility as we move towards that? Does it, are we also moving towards accessibility? Uh, I, so, so here's the thing. Accessibility to me is a natural fallout of the entire push that we're doing to try and make HCI more and more intuitive, more and more uh, sort of like really actually mean what we're trying to get across. Because like right now, we have a very sort of like low fidelity avatar. We don't really have full control over our hands, much less our faces, much less, you know, we, we still have our voices in here, but we don't have uh, um, nonverbal communication very much. We We can't really like quickly do things with our hands and, and have it and have it translate well. Um, a lot of the ways in which I want to communicate with you are not quite there yet. And so like, even for us, this system isn't fully accessible. And so like in, in getting through all the challenges necessary for even us to be fully accessible in within this environment, we what, we're not we're not just making this application better. We're making human understanding better, such that like not only will we be more accessible into this environment, but people that um, you know either like if I have one arm or if I'm holding a a bag of groceries, it's essentially the same thing as far as like gesture recognition is concerned, right? And so like if I make a system that can deal with the fact that I have a bag of groceries in my hand, I've also made a system that works for somebody with one arm. And so um, exactly. getting, getting this system to embrace humanity and the variability of humanity is, to me, the very definition of accessibility. And, and we have to embrace accessibility as a first order sort of notion uh, uh, instead of like, I can make a super, super abstract set of buttons that people that have full, full use can make can can learn and make use of, and if I have time at the end of the project, I can tack on some accessibility features. Versus, if if I design the the application right from the start to be able to handle, oh, I'm holding I'm I'm holding groceries, or or I've got an apple in my mouth, and therefore I can't talk, or or whatever whatever disability you might have foisted upon you at any given point. If it really is a lifestyle device that can handle the vast variability of humanity, then you almost get accessibility by like like just it just sort of happened and so uh, um to me to me that that i think is is why this is so important because suddenly everybody because everybody has a little disability of some form some people have a much larger and more pronounced one but like you know just at any given point there might be several things that just don't work and so the the, the article that i wrote about entrainment really starts to talk about like just the, the fact, fact that the fact, fact that, that we're all sitting on this couch doesn't isn't what really makes us present to each other as humans. It's more about the fact that if I can share some sense of synchronization with your emotionality or your area of attention, or even better yet, like like specific behaviors. I was responding a lot to what Brian was sharing just now because I was thinking about um, just back to. I mean, immersive environments go back to the date of 
I guess, whenever cave paintings originated and people wanted to tell stories and be surrounded by the images that um, stood for that. And I think, um, you know, as, as humans, one of the one of the things that connects would be if I pointed my finger to something and said, hey, look over there, that orange chair in the corner. And other people look too to what I'm pointing at. It's kind of recognizing the significance of thoughts, reflections, having some kind of collective sharing and conversation. So, you know, I, I really respond to the entrainment concepts. What does it mean to really engage? How do we have collective and individual experiences um, inside any environment that have some kind of meaning and resonance? And I would say recently the exciting part that's led into the book project is this question of um, how we get ourselves in both the most grounded and present frame of mind and also the most innovative and creative. So um, I think that, you know, through studies of cognition, emotion, engagement, you know, it's not enough to put people into a space that's really, uh, that's really stimulating. You have to give them a purpose and something to do. And as soon as we start interacting and collaborating, which means that, you know, we somehow know how to read and reach each other, um, then we start to have some kind of response to what what is the uh, environment so so that's that's a little bit about what i do i i frame experiences um i'm somebody who goes in and designs experiences runs trainings and workshops and uh, through a lot of my research into the emotional design of those products and experiences i've gotten to work with a lot of great people and that work led into this book that's about leading transformative experiences, uh, specifically in VR, but it crosses over into the AR and MR space. Um, and I think, you know, something to point out about, about identity, too, is that, um, you know, in, in some of the recent uh, research, we have more of a plasticity of mindset when we're inside new environments. You know, we want to we figure things out, and sometimes we can we can also lose our sense of uh, self-consciousness. So that's really interesting. Um, the overall title of my book is called Designing Wonder, because there are certain aspects of wonder uh, in spaces. Even here, right now, I'm experiencing a sense of wonder. And so I kind of lose myself a little bit. Um, and I think back to accessibility, that that willingness to ride the ride, and that that feeling of being uplifted um, sometimes, sometimes even, even though we're in you know a state of fidelity being refined and some of the mechanics might seem a little bit basic at the moment we still experience that sense of wonder and curiosity um, and it that, that means, means it can be a great space to learn to interact to laugh you know yeah, to, to share, share emotions um, so you know this this topic has many different offshoots. And uh, what I like to do is, you know, if, if this is the frame of the hero's journey, which I, you know, speak and write about a lot, we all come in. And I think accessibility-wise, if there's a hurdle, people might come in as the hero feeling a little bit intimidated by um, whether it's new technology or whether it's a medium that they don't have resources to really access. Um, different people can play the mentor along the way and uh, welcome them to the new spaces, give them a talisman or some kind of elixir that helps them in their journey. You know, I speak about it metaphorically, but I think it's been one of my um, great joys to have the role of playing the mentor at times in the spaces and uh, inviting people to have a new experience inside of XR that both lifts them up emotionally and also gives them a better sense of purpose as they try to solve problems and, and go into this new world um, and then translate it back into what the hero's journey would call their ordinary world. Um, so, yeah, there, there are many, many, many ways that entrainment and uh, these topics have layers and crossovers. Absolutely. And I know, Thomas, that you have chosen to use 
uh, Mozilla Hubs for your VR meetup on accessibility. And I would imagine that some of the things that are being talked about now are, are some of the reasons that you chose to do that. You want to talk a little bit about your uh, thinking process there and tell us about your meetup. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I bring um, you know an additional perspective here on um, also maybe a reality check for everyone attending today on the accessibility most of the platforms that we use for people with disabilities, like unfortunately today, facial that we're in, I think it would be very, very difficult to join or participate if you were blind or low vision to actually even get in and, and use this app in its current state. And that, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities and work that needs to happen from the manufacturers like Oculus, like HoloLens um, to enable that. Um, this is one of the reasons to do our meetup. I know we're here at OpenAR Cloud and talking about open technologies. One thing I really have always appreciated from Mozilla is the commitment to open standards and accessibility. So one thing when we started, we, we host a monthly meetup um, similar to this, having conversations about XR topics and how to make those accessible to people with disabilities. Um, I chose Mozilla Hubs as the environment to host my meetup in because I work with someone who's actually blind, and I said, hey, can you log in and get into this and actually join and participate? And she was able to do that. Um, we, we blogged about that experience um, on our eClentry website. But I was motivated to do this work from attending educators in VR, you know, which is for all these teachers and educators working in higher education and primary education. That experience was done in alt space VR, so another platform similar to spatial. Um, and I wasn't able to have, uh, you know, the person I work with join me in that experience. She basically had to rely on if they did choose to stream it to YouTube or to Zoom, like probably most of you all are attending this meeting. And so that's something that was really important to me to start my meetup with. Let's start from a platform that it's not perfectly accessible, but it does have like uh, the door just to get inside. So I, li I like to talk about that of like, if you can't even get in the door, you can't log in, you can't even get through the, you know, first onboarding experience. It really shows the company hasn't put thought or commitment um, into accessibility. So that's part of my passion is just encouraging people like accessibility can be very overwhelming when you have to consider all of the different uh, types of disabilities and all the different features that might, might need to be added. But I think I want to encourage all of us to start, you know, just from, um, hey, being social and engaging, especially in times like coronavirus, we all want to participate in these conversations and we want to be able to, you know, join in. And so maybe all of the special features in spatial, for example, of like, we can import post-it notes, we can write with a pen, Maybe those aren't accessible first, but getting logged in, being able to hear the conversation, being able to talk to people, or maybe navigate between rooms or spaces, that is really important. So um, long story short, you know, my meetup, we, we try to be honest that we're not totally accessible, but we take feedback from the community and we actually log all of that feedback with Mozilla Hub. And then they actually have a GitHub where they post, here's what we're working on. Um, and I love that transparency from like an open source company. You don't get that from, you know, most major companies, any sort of real transparency of what they're doing for accessibility. So, um, again, I think that's celebrating open AR cloud and also that's a good thing about Mozilla. So, um, Thomas, I love that you're using the technology and uh, you're, you're doing testing as you go, right? So you're doing usability testing and you're learning about how to make it more accessible as you're doing uh, the meetups is very meta and I think that's what we're trying to do a little bit here too is mm -hmm. actually use the technology and help figure out the bumps to move it forward. Um, so Yuhang, one of the first bits of research I did when I was doing a paper for OpenAir Cloud um, for the first symposium, uh, one of the things I read was your QC, QC paper. paper. And I was very inspired by the fact that I saw the possibilities for this open AR cloud 
and the technology to really help people so much, right? And that it would be like a natural extension. And so can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing in more detail? I know you mentioned it in your introduction. Yeah, thank you, Susan, for uh, mentioning yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> So QC was actually uh, a mixed reality system that I designed for people with low vision to enhance their visual ability in a visual search task. Uh, so I actually uh, believe that with the advances of AI and mixed reality technology, we can it actually offered a great opportunity to enhance people's different abilities uh, directly. Uh, for, uh, for example, with AI, AI automatically, automatically uh, scanning and recognizing the surrounding uh, information that cannot be that easily to be perceived by people with disability, and by under, deeply understanding about what people can do, what their skills and the, what their abilities are, as uh, Brian mentioned, the humanity part, we can actually design a more suitable and tailored mix reality user interfaces to communicate the, all the recognized information for people with disabilities to actually enhance their ability and experience in their daily life. So, for example, uh, most of my uh, research uh, focuses on people with low vision, which means uh, uh, these people, they have vision impairments, but they are not completely blind. So uh, a little bit background knowledge is uh, low vision actually is very complicated and it includes many different visual conditions. For example, the people can have central vision loss, peripheral vision loss, or blind spots inside of their vision. But the interesting thing is, different from people who are completely blind, low vision people, they actually have functional vision and most of them prefer using their vision in all kinds of daily activities. So, so that's, that's the reason I started, started to uh, think about what if we can uh, leverage their uh, functional vision and use mixed reality technology to further uh, augment their visual abilities via uh, different uh, visual augmentations. So take QC as an example. Um, so it was designed uh, to help low vision people for visual search tasks. So for example, looking for a specific target product on a very crowded grocery store, which is very uh, challenging for people with low vision. So what QC can do is, instead of having low vision people to get very close to the shelf and scan each item one by one, it has a camera to automatically scan around the environment and recognize the target that was assigned by the user. And then it can generate different visual cues, for example, a flash or different guidelines to orient and attract the user's attention so that they can simply follow these visual cues and find the target very easily and quickly. So uh, QC is just one example, and I've actually have been working on uh, designing different types of mixed reality systems uh, with different visual uh, augmentations to help people with low vision in many different cases. For example, to help them uh, walk on stairs more safely, I design different visual highlights that can be projected by the edges of the stairs so that low vision people can notice the existence and also the exact position of each stair easily when they're walking on the stairs. And also in terms of uh, navigation or wayfinding, I also design AR applications that can generate both visual and audio augmentations uh, and visual uh, wayfinding gui uh, guidance to help them find a destination location very quickly. So with all of these projects, uh, I want to say that uh, Mixed Reality is definitely a very powerful platform that offers this unique opportunity for us to enhance people's abilities directly. But what is also very important is for us to deeply understand uh, different people's abilities, needs, and perceptions so that we can design more suitable uh, augmentations and applications that can fulfill different people's needs. Thank you, Yu Hong. Um, and I know, uh, Brian, that you're, you're looking at similar things as Yu Hong in terms of mixing sensors and AI, and, but you're taking it from a little bit of a different perspective in terms of creating, uh, creating interfaces that actually know what we want before we maybe even know ourselves. So can you, can you talk a little bit uh, about that and what you're doing there? I know you did some of that work 
with Magic Leap, um, with the tracking of the eyes and yeah, so it, it's it's fun. Predicting um, intention. I did I did uh, you know some like I said so much work in HDI that like I, I consider myself sort of an expert. And then when I went to Magic Leap, I learned I learned more about optometry than I ever thought I would. I learned more about all, all of these other subjects. And one thing that was interesting that started to come up after a while was that um, when you when you go to point at something, you're you're firing a group of muscles to move your hand, right? And likewise, when you when you go to look at something, you're firing a group of muscles to move your head and your eyes, right? And firing a group of muscles is firing a group of muscles. And so, like, if you are tracking all three of those events with enough rigor, you can actually see a very very similar acceleration structure, uh, sort of curve in all three of those things. And so when I go to look at Caitlin or point at Caitlin, my hand starts to move, my head moves, and my eyes move all at the same exact moment. Now my head and my eyes get there quite a bit before my hand. But cognitively, I have not finished this pointing activity until my hand finishes pointing, right? So when the computer can actually recognize that sort of like multimodal correlate between those three, it knows not only that you intend on pointing, targeting, um, but it also probably knows what the target of that act will be. So I can somewhat tell you what the attention and the intent of the human is before they finish, finish the physical act of, of even finishing that act. And so once the interfaces can start acting on human attention and human intention, you can like be very, very contextually aware when you start using these types of concepts because they not only like are much richer human centric concepts but they're actually predicting so now instead of a button waiting for my finger to penetrate it physically in space um i, I in, in some cases, cases can have up to a quarter of a second of predictive power knowing that i'm about to finish pointing at a particular button and so i can i can have the interface react to that what's awesome about that is is that again, I'm using multiple mod modalities to kind of make sure that that's as robust as possible. But if one of those modalities isn't, isn't quite at the same level as the other, I can, I can tune the system to change the weightings on those different modalities and the way that it uses them together to try and like make up for particular deficiencies. But the, the, the correlate will still be there. And so um, that particular system it's not only powerful in that it's a predictive system, but it's powerful in that it inherently takes into account variability of different people and, and of different like abilities of different people. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that the Open um, AR Cloud is doing with the Open Spatial Computing Platform uh, is working on a number of initiatives, including RML or Reality Modeling Language. And I know that this is an area that both uh, Thomas and Yu Hong are very interested in. Thomas, can you tell us a little bit about what 60 degree audio descriptors are for people who are blind and low vision? And then Yu Hong, I'm gonna ask you to share a little bit of thoughts that I know you're doing some research into that area. And um, if you could talk anything related to uh, creating a taxonomy or structure for reality modeling language. Sure. Great. Yeah. So I think um, the the first part of uh, considering this idea of 360 degree audio descriptions is first making sure we all understand what an audio description is. So if you start from like watching a Netflix movie, Netflix, pretty much any show that Netflix produces now, if you go into your settings, you can turn on an audio channel that will describe what's happening in the visual action on the screen. Um, and so if you aren't looking at the screen, maybe you're driving, maybe you're blind, maybe you're low vision, you can actually find out what's happening on the screen. Um, and kind of famously, Netflix started this based off of uh, that action hero show they had Daredevil, which was about a blind superhero. And a lot of the sounds on that show were just punches and jumps and kicks. So they actually had um, a lawsuit and a request to provide these descriptions because it's like, hey, if I only hear like punching sounds and kicks, I have no idea what the story is or what's happening on the screen. So that's, that's an audio description is I need to know what's happening 
on the screen while it's happening. But with VR and AR, now we have to consider, well, depending on which way I turn in the room, I may need a description. Depending on which direction I look, I'm, I'm going to need a different audio description. And so that's been um, part of our research at Equal Entry, working with people that are blind and low vision to come up with some ideas and prototypes for that. There's some cool research projects in Europe for how to create like a coded standard where people can actually encode audio descriptions for different directions. Um, when you think about real time, like we are here, there's exciting technology called Be My Eyes from Denmark. And that's an app that someone that's blind or low vision can turn on and use their camera and have a person remotely anywhere in the world describe what they're seeing. And so we have kind of found with current technology that that's probably the best idea for us to think about for making XR accessible is we need to make sure that these platforms can be streamed remotely or that someone, maybe a sighted assistant, a sighted assistant that's not actually next to the person can see what someone's seeing in the headset and then give a description like, hey, you're looking at Susan now, or hey, you're looking out at a mountain vista and there's an orange chair. Um, so that's something that as the technology advances, hopefully more of this can become uh, automatic, uh, automated and automatically accessible. But probably for now, considering let's make sure that the platforms allow for people to show what their headset's seeing to someone else, so that, that 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 way, someone else that could see the scene can describe it adequately and help someone complete the task. And then, Yuhang, I know you got excited when I shared with you that we are working on a reality modeling language um, protocol, and ha I know that that was something that you were interested in. Has your research taken you very far at this point? Yeah, so uh, how to make uh, the spatial uh, uh, 3D uh, space accessible uh, and how to effectively convey the 3D information to uh, people, especially with visual impairments, is definitely uh, one very uh, important and also challenging uh, research direction that I'm very interested in. Uh, and uh, I'm working on uh, constructing, for example, accessibility standard and also explore how can we design novel and also uh, usable technologies to make the uh, uh, 3D space more accessible for people with visual impairments. And audio description is, of course, one very important uh, perspective. And uh, Thomas has done a really amazing job. He's definitely the pioneer in that. Uh, and I also want to add a little bit to that is uh, besides the uh, verbal uh, audio description, uh, because now we are in VR, right? Uh, uh, it's effectively conveying the, the information accessibly is one uh, is on one hand and on the other hand we also should uh, keep in mind that we want still want to keep the original immersive experience that we are or mixed reality in general are supposed to provide to people. Uh, that's why another thought that I have is what if we can also, Think about, for example, some other audio modalities, uh, not only uh, speech, but also say some background music that can convey the theme of the VR scene or some sound uh, effects or 3D uh, uh, spatial audio to uh, indicate the position of, uh, for example, some uh, important objects in the room. Uh, and also beyond uh, audio modality, I think we can also consider uh, other sensory channels, for example, uh, haptic feedback. Uh, one example is uh, I've been uh, collaborating with Microsoft Research on designing a haptic controller to enable blind people to freely walk uh, and navigate in a virtual space. So uh, this controller is called controller because it is uh, designed to slow uh, cane cane controller. controller, so it's yeah, the white cane, cane controller, because it's designed to simulate the interaction of a white cane in people's real life. So if a blind user can sweep the controller, like sweeping a white cane, and then this controller can generate haptic and also audio feedback to simulate the real world uh, cane uh, experience. For example, if the, uh, the virtual cane hits a virtual object, you can actually uh, feel the force feedback and also hear the sound of the uh, tape of the can hitting the, the different materials of the object. So it's um, 
leveraging both audio and haptic feedback to uh, convey the 3D information to people who are blind. And actually, beside uh, yeah, my work uh, in uh, uh, the research field, uh, in HCI field, people has uh, also explored different sensations, for example, the smell or thermal uh, sensing, so that they can generate a richer and more immersive experience. So I think all of these technologies, they are not exactly designed for people uh, with disabilities, but we can definitely adapt these technologies to make the space more accessible and also uh, bring people a much better immersive experience for people with diverse abilities. Yeah, and I, I think that's what we were getting at earlier with the, as, as we increase the entrainment of spaces, uh, that naturally a fallout is going to be that they become more accessible as we increase the use of different senses. In the course of the book is adding in exercises and resources uh, that have have a lot of the experiences embedded in them. So for example, the one on um, immersive design and how you can increase a sense of empathy and emotion, I have like suggested, go in and um, experience Last of Us is one of the recommendations. Uh, there's also notes on blindness that can give people who are kind of new to these experiences a great sense of empathy with what someone might be feeling and sensing when they're blind. Um, so. I think that's one of the reasons that uh, it's nice to have these these tools now where we can say, you know, not just a list of um, things to try, but, but why you might want to have emotional intelligence tied in there as leaders um, or as people who are working in groups. You, you could be the person that needs the accessibility, um, some kind of function that assists you, or you could be somebody that doesn't need that, but you want to empathize with your group and be able to understand different perspectives. So um, yeah, that's just a little invitation. I'll be putting out a lot for free over the next few days. And um, I don't know, I, this panel is catching me at the date that the book actually goes public is tonight. So I have um, I have a discount out on my site. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's just been, I mean, Jeremy Balenson's part of the book, Skip Rizzo, a lot of different researchers, you know, adding their, their um, research and their, their findings on the crossovers between emotional intelligence, user-centered design, and accessibility. So I just wanted to say if, if people actually want those, um, those experiences that tell you how you can plan um, for a group, uh, I'm offering a lot of resources and you can check out the book on my page if you're interested. Um, I have put up a discount associated with this event because it just feels like the right time to um, make it human and make it more accessible. As far as emotionality is concerned, I mean, every Hollywood movie will teach you lessons of, of plenty about how the, the power of music to, to yeah. imbue a ton of, of nuanced emotion. Mm -hmm. And Brian, you were also talking about, um, are there any uses of senses that might be blind spots for us as creators? I mean, I think all of them are. I mean, the, the one thing <laughs> I've learned when I went to Magic Leap is that I barely know anything about the human body, really. And, and um, just everything from the fact that, like, uh, touch Touch is, is a super powerful thing that I, I'm looking forward to getting better and better on. Like, like I think that everybody loves gesture control, but to, to be brutally honest, a lot of gestures tend to die when you're up against the wall or up against the table. And that's actually when I want the gestures to work the, the most, because I want to be able to feel that wall with my hand and, and, and get a sense that it's real and get a sense that my hand is there. But I also, um, proprioceptive, Touch like if I have an interface that's on my on my hand and I can touch it with my other hand, I effectively get you know haptic feedback from both sides of that of that interaction, and it's a very powerful grounding thing that, that lets me see a digital effect happen on a very very physical physical act. And so touch, I think, is people people think of it as like the touch screen, but in reality, your entire skin is a touch surface. <laughs> And, and, and being able to use it and being able to like have digital stuff interact with that particular 
your largest sense organ, I think, is largely, you know, ignored. Uh, um, and again, like like to the to the audio thing that they were talking about before, I think that right now we, we do use it as, as a soundtrack, we do use it as sound effects, but it's also a beautiful tool for for getting attention to to move around to to um, you know doing doing any number of different things with with audio if you have the ability to do spatial audio to to basically paint audio pixels in the same way that you can paint visual pixels. And so, so a lot, lot of that, that just, again, is not, not different, different ways to give, give spatial, spatial information, information to the person. person. So you can mimic how it works in real life a lot better, but you can also then, again, be giving people who have a deficiency in one thing, but who can pick up on, on, on another sense much, much more heightened and, and, and make things more accessible by having multiple ways in which the information is being given to the, the user's sense, sense spatially. On that note, I want, I want to, to thank, thank our volunteers, uh, Andreas oh, and, and Don. <laughs> I definitely want to give uh, a big shout out to Phase 2 for being our location sponsor and for also uh, giving, giving us an extraordinary amount of time as we worked, worked out all the technology here in this uh, physical space. And of course, we want to give a big shout out to Spatial for the use of their technology They've been extremely generous and making it available to the community prior to their recent launch. So we want to give a big shout out to everybody that um, really worked very hard to, to make this panel possible.